I bet they're just like, I bet their minds are blown. Like, yeah, I mean, I, cool. we, we, we were going to have them come on tonight, but it's just not at the same, like after COVID they're finally like all together in physical space and they're in this beautiful place. So it, yeah. it feels smarter for them to just be, you know, obviously they all have the link, but yeah. Um, I just felt like, you know, they should just be in the, in the moment. Yeah. yeah, right on. That's so cool. I'm so glad it's been such a positive experience. It's been exhausting and it hasn't always been easy, but sure, yeah. But the results are, have been deep. Like I feel I feel like I I got so much from them already. That's amazing. They haven't even written their papers yet. No, <laughs> but we're talking about those, their ideas, you know, and the ideas that the work is bringing up and um, so that's good. Awesome. I see Suzanne there. Hi, May. Suzanne is here. I see her in Hi, May's Zoom box. Hi, Suzanne. Oh, hi, Suzanne. Hi. Oh, there's. Hi, Izzy. Hi, Izzy. Hi. Hi. Good to see you guys. <laughs> We're having a good time up here. Yay, I'm so glad. We miss you, Emily. I know, I wish I was with you. Sounds like it's been really deep, rich experience, and I'm just so glad to hear. Really? Mm -hmm. All right, are we gonna let other people in? Are we opening the green room door? I think we can. Does anybody else oh. hear a little static? Okay, you guys tell me if it's me. I think so. Yeah. I'll turn that off for now. Okay. My white noise machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome. As we wait for everyone to join us, I will start this week uh, again with the embroidery of the week. And honestly, every single one I open up, they're all so beautiful. Um, but this week, I'm featuring these mushrooms, which I found so enchanting, um, in particular because the original pattern did not have the, the green um, grass, like the landscape around the mushrooms. And so I really, really loved the creativity that was added to this embroidery, um, as well as, as the colors. I thought they were, they were really beautiful and, and, the, and the detail. Um, so I will continue with my name. I'm Jen, I'm calling in from Studio City. I use she, her pronouns. And tonight I am going to continue my underground embroidery. Um, and we'll just spend the next couple minutes um, introducing ourselves and uh, I will now pass it to Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm calling in from West Covina and I too will continue with my yellow romp, romper, romp, no, romp, ramp. I don't know, it's covered, but there. And I'm happy to be here. Um, I will pass it over to Patricia. Hello, uh, Patricia Watts, um, it, co coming in from Santa Fe, the uh, lands of the uh, Tewa people. It's called Ogopoge, meaning white, white shell water place. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'll go, I'll pass it on to James Oliver. Hi everybody, uh, James here. Uh, pronouns are he, him. And uh, tonight I'll be reading and listening and um, discussing with y'all. I will pass it to Rochelle. Hi, Rochelle. Hi, hi James, hi everybody. Um, Rochelle, uh, she, her, and Boa. Um, are my 
pronouns, and I'm uh, calling in tonight from Ipswich, Massachusetts, and I'm happy to listen, and I think I'll be brushing Boa at the same time. Good to see everybody. Sorry, I forgot to pass it. I'm going to pass it on to Cascade. Wonderful to see you, Rochelle, and everyone. My name is Cascade. I'm calling in from Los Angeles, California. Um, she, her pronouns, still working on my common raven. She's coming along. And I will pass it to Lauren Bond with some musical background. Hi, I'm Lauren. Uh, she, they pronouns calling in from the Gertrude Stein Salon. Um, uh, in ambiguous time space, um, but in on the territory of the Paiute Shoshone tribe. Um, glad to be with you tonight, and I pass it on to Izzy. Hello. Oh, actually, that's Suzanne. Um, oh, Vivian, Suzanne, Lacey. Hi, Michelle. Oh, hi, Patricia. Hi. Long time. Yeah. Patricia Watts. Good to see oh. you. Good to see you. So I'm Izzy. Um, <laughs> I'm calling in uh, with Suzanne from Lone Pine, and uh, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm actually making a puttanesca. So yeah, I'm really hungry and excited to listen and eat. <laughs> I will call on um, Derainer. Hi, Derainer, calling in from uh, Baldwin Hills. Uh, go by the uh, she, her pronoun. And I am <clears throat> working on the yellow romper bird. I haven't started yet. I'm getting ready to start tonight. So I'm excited. And I finished my sunflower. Um, so I will be sending that in. And I will pass it to, let's see, has um, Jaime gone yet? No, but I do have barking dogs on the background. Um, I'm Jaime, I'm in Lone Pine, he, him pronouns. Uh, normally I share the screen, but I think Emily's going to help out with that today. Uh, I will be here and I will read with you guys. <laughs> and maybe somebody else can pick somebody. I'm not sure who hasn't gone yet. Olan Jones, I choose. <laughs> if that's okay. I am Olan Jones. I'm in the middle of California in a motel heading north for the weekend uh, and using she, her pronouns as I do it. <laughs> and I am working on a bird. A bird. I'm starting to put all the yellow into the bird. Wow. And I shall pass it along to Emily. You haven't said anything yet, have you? Okay. Thank you, Ole Jones. You're Thank welcome, you. Emily Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cascade Wilhelm. Thank you, everyone here. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm calling in from Echo Park, neighborhood of Los Angeles, uh, neighborhood of many crazy beautiful staircases that go along steep topography up and down near Elysian Park. I'll be sharing the screen tonight and putting cookies in and out of the oven because I have a whole bunch of cookie batter in the kitchen that I made for this kind of cookie called a cowboy cookie. I don't know if anyone is familiar but it's a new discovery for me and uh, I ate one of them today. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope you liked it. Is uh, it like a biscuit? What is it? It's like a very hearty cookie 
that almost has like a trail mixy kind of feeling. It's got coconut, oats, nuts, chocolate chips, cinnamon. So it is kind of bready and nutty, a um, little bit biscuit-like. And uh, I just can't stop eating them. They're so good. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me pass it on to Sylvia. I haven't seen you in a while. It's nice to see you again, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thanks. I'm Sylvia Holmes. I'm in Pasadena, California. I use she, her pronouns. I'm working on white sage. And there it is. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to. Actually, I'll take it from here. Okay, go ahead. And then if you haven't had an opportunity to introduce yourself and um, there will be an opportunity later this evening, um, I do hope Emily, you do share your cookies with us at a later time so we can see what those look like. Um, <laughs> beautiful. Uh, so welcome everyone. The Metabolic Studios Learning and Mending series is now in its fourth evolution. This time around, we are addressing disturbance ecology and what emerges in the blasted landscape of capitalism. To do this, we will be collectively reading Anna Singh's The Mushroom at the End of the World on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. Growing through the last three gatherings, the first learning syllabus in response to ongoing racial violence, particularly at the hands of the police. The second, holding space for the mega fires that have consumed the West. And the third, addressing a larger reality of suffocation and the need for us to revive our breath. In order to get a deeper understanding of these crises and how they're interconnected, we are building upon the readings in the last three series. Many of you have received embroidery kits from us of native plants representing the food and medicine that Metabolic Studio is cultivating. We are adding some new embroidery patterns. We also have more native plants and bird patterns available too. The theme of the embroideries we've been working towards is biocenosis, which is an association of diverse organisms forming a closely integrated community. If you haven't received an embroidery kit or you finished yours and would like to receive another one, Please send your name and mailing address to info at metabolicstudio.org. And Cindy will put that information in the chat bar right now. We've decided to close the entrance to the Zoom space after the first 15 minutes of the reading to protect the flow and to keep a steady breath. These gatherings are being recorded through Zoom for archival purposes. We thank you for co-creating this opportunity to learn and to mend together during quarantine. Tonight, We'll read chapter 14, Serendipity, from The Mushroom at the End of the World by Anna Seng. This 10-week series will focus solely on this one book, and our guiding question is what lives in the ruins we've made. Since the ongoing pandemic began, we have moved our weekly public studio practice to Zoom, where we have committed ourselves to learning and mending together. We invite you to receive these readings as a deep inhale and we find that crafting together helps to receive these readings as a meditation. We will share our screen and we encourage you to read a section of the text aloud with us. When there is a pause in the reading, please feel free to unmute yourself and begin where the last person left off. Silence is golden and there is no pressure to fill the transitional spaces while we enjoy a breath and continue crafting. Feel free to jump in and continue reading at your comfort level. You don't have to read. It's also fine to enjoy listening. And now I will pass it over to James where he will uh, discuss tonight's reading. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. James again. And in a tradition, uh, I will share the discussion question for tonight before the reading. And after the reading, I'll share it again before we go into some breakout rooms. So uh, I'm posting it here in the chat. but. The question tonight is the title of this chapter is Serendipity. How does the example of lodgepoles and their circumstantial partnering with Matsutake affect your understanding of how ecological relations form in the forest? This relationship requires years of coordination by humans and non-humans, volcanic eruptions, clear-cutting ponderosas, 
and the exclusion of fire by forest management. And uh, with that, Emily, will you pull up the reading? I think we can start on page uh, 192 with the photo, and I'll read the caption for the photo. OK, great, thanks. Active Landscapes, Oregon. Oh, there it is. Uh, critics describe the Eastern Cascades forest as festering sores on the back of a mangy old dog. And even its foresters admit that management has been a series of mistakes. Yet for pickers, this forest is ground zero in the contingency of air, sometimes mushrooms pop up. Chapter 14, Serendipity. When old timers explained that Oregon's Eastern Cascades had once been the center for industrial logging, I could hardly believe them. All I saw was the highway flanked by unhealthy looking trees. Although a few road signs said industrial forest People showed me where towns and mills had once flourished, but now there was nothing but brush. They took me to now vanished homes, hotels, and hobo camps. The hobos had left piles of rusting cans, but towns were gone to scruffy strands of overcrowded pines, neither wilderness nor civilization. The folks who remained made do with this and that. On the highway, shut down stores sagged with broken windows. Business businesses mixed guns and liquor sales. Signs on driveways said uninvited guests would be shot. When a new truck stop opened, they said no one showed up for the pre-employment opening meeting because they had heard about the company's drug testing and personal surveillance. Anyone who lives out here wants to be left alone someone explained. Resource management does not always lead to the effects it, it expects. One place to look for life in the forest is in those plans undoing. Mistakes were made, but mushrooms popped up. In the Eastern Cascades is managed, excuse me, the Eastern Cascades is managed for industrial pine, but it does not look like Finnish Lapland. The forest is messy. Dead wood lies and leans everywhere. Trees are often scraggly and either sparse or densely packed. Dwarf mistletoe and root sap, root rot sap their strength. In contrast to Finland, where small holders jointly manage most of the forest, Cascade Matsutake grows on national forest or else timber company land. There are a few forest, excuse me, there are a few smallest, small forest owners to coordinate management. This is just as well for forest management dreams because white residents and visitors tend to resent the idea of forest reg regulation as iconic of an overreaching federal government. They shoot holes in the forest service signs and boast about the rules they flaunt. The Forest Service works to appeal to them, but it is an uphill battle. Social scientists often stress the bureaucratic assertiveness of the US Forest Service. Yet the foresters I met in the Eastern Cascades were humble in their explanations of forest management. Their programs, they said, were a series of experiments and almost all of them had failed. How, for example, should they deal with the lodge poles that just kept coming back in denser thickets? They tried clear cutting, which created those dense thickets. They tried saving seed, seed trees and shelter wood, but lone trees were blown down by the wind and snow. Should they try to save 
jobs at the one remaining logging mill, even when it means clashing with environmentalists in court. Although environmental goals have changed Forest Service rhetoric, district offices are still evaluated by, by the board of feet of timber they generate. There was nothing to do, they said, but deal with each dilemma as it arose. Since there was no good alternative, they just kept trying. The landscape has not made forest management easy. While, as in Finland, there were glaciers in the US Pacific Northwest, pines occupy the Eastern Cascades for a different reason. A volcanic eruption some 700 and uh, some 7,500 years ago, covered the region with lava, ash, and pumice. The air filled, uh, sorry, the air filled stone that results when ejected lava cools. If there was organic soil there before, it was buried. There are still blocks of lava and pumice beds where almost nothing grows. That pine grows that pines grow at all on this unfriendly ground seems a miracle. And one for which Matsutake can claim some credit. Matsutake grows with many host trees in Oregon in the wet mixed conifer forests found at high altitudes. Matsutake is abundant with Shasta red fir, mountain hemlock, and sugar pine. On western Cascade slopes, it is sometimes found with Douglas fir on the Oregon coast. Matsutake grows with tan oak. On the dry eastern slopes of the Cascades, Matsutake lives with ponderosa pines. In each of these sites, there are other fungi where the relationship between tree and fungus starts to get exclusive is the lodgepole pine forests. Foraging in lodgepole, one only occasionally spots another mushroom species. This is not a sure sign of lack of understand. Uh, this is not a sure sign of lack of underground diversity. Many fungi rarely send up fruiting bodies. Still, it seems clear that an especially intimate companionship has formed between Matsutake and Lodgepole in the Eastern Cascades. Like most friendships, this one depends on chance meetings and small beginnings that later surge into significance. Both protagonists were once neglected. If now they dominate regional news, there must be a story. Deploring, deploying their own blasted landscapes metaphor, forages call this area ground zero of the American Matsutake scene. What brought fungus and root together with such spectacular results? When whites first, start, first came to the Eastern Cascades in the 19th century, they did not notice lodgepole. Instead, they stood in awe of, giant, of the giant ponderosa that dominated the forest. According to historian William Robbins, these pine forests once were the most impressive and spectacular of Oregon's interior forests. The trees were huge and they were surrounded by park-like open country with little underbrush. U.S. Army Captain John Charles Fremont came through in 1834. Today, the country was all pine forest. The timber was uniformly large. Some of the pines were measuring 22 feet in circumference and 12 and 13 feet at six above. A turn of the century USGS surveyor added, the forest floor is often as clean as if it had been cleared and one may ride or drive without hindrance. The 1910 newspaper made the obvious connection. No timber in the world can be logged more easily. Ponderosa timber attracted both government and industry. 
1893, President Grover Cleveland created Cascade Forest Reserve. Soon a race was on to construct railroads to bring out the timber. And by the early 20th century, lumbermen had obtained title to huge lots. By 1930s, Oregon timber dominated the U.S. wood industry. Eastern Cascade Ponderosa in heavy demand were logged as fast as fellers could get to them. The mix of public and private land shaped the timing of logging. Before World War II, timber companies pressured the government to keep national forests closed, to keep prices high. By the end of the war, private lands were depleted and the same voices then called for opening the national forests. Only this, they said, could keep the mills open, preventing unemployment and national wood shortages. Afterwards, national forests increasingly bore the brunt of logging. The impact of logging changed with post-war practices of industrial forestry. Forests buoyed by the optimism of new technologies, as well as the boom to economy, had an idea of how national forests could be opened without depleting their timber. All they had to do was replace decadent, overmature, old growth forests with fast growing, vigorous young trees, which would be harvestable in predictable 80 to 100 year intervals. They might even plant superior stock, making the new forests faster growing and more resistant to pests and disease. New technologies were making it practical to remove all the trees, not just the most desirable ones. Thus, foresters turned to clear cutting. Clear cutting would lead to renewal, even as it made the forest into units of expansion. The faster the forest was cut, according to this logic, the more productive it would become. Some local foresters were not convinced, but the force of national op opinion swept them along. In the 1970s, replanting after cutting became standard practice. Aerial spraying against weeds was also used in some areas. As one Eastern Cascade forester recalled in the vision of that period, forests of the future would be dominated by a mosaic of 25 to 40 acre even age stands of healthy, intensively managed young growth. What went wrong with the post-war vision? Ponderosa was increasingly logged out and it did not grow back, at least not readily. It was missing fire. The great Ponderosa in their open parks had emerged together with the Native American, together with Native American fire regimes in which frequent burning of the underbrush encouraged browse for deer and berries for fall picnic picking. Fire burned out competing conifer species while allowing the ponderosas to, tr to thrive. But whites drove the Native Americans in a series of wars and relocations. The Forest Service stopped not only their fires, but all fires. Without fire, flammable species such as white fir and lodgepole grew up under the ponderosas. When the ponderosas were removed through logging, these other species took, took over. The open character of the landscape disappeared as small trees grew in. Pure stands of ponderosa became rare. The landscape looked less and less like the open ponderosa forests of the early 20th century, and less and less like a landscape of interest to the timber industry. In dispossessing Native peoples from the lands they had made so inviting, in dispossessing Native peoples from the lands they had made so inviting, white loggers, soldiers, and foresters destroyed the park-like forests they had wanted so badly. To pause in recollection, it seems useful to tell of the last great Native dispossession by fiat. The, the 1954 termination or ending of all treaty obligations to the Klamath tribes. As a result of termination, a chunk of Ponderosa land became national forest, ready to be logged by private interests. A few decades later, what was left? The quotations that follow from the tribe's website help tell the story. 
The prosperous and powerful Klamath, Modoc, and the Yahuskin band of Snake Paiute people here and after the Klamaths once controlled 22 million acres of territory in South Central Oregon and Northern California. Their lifestyles and economies provided abundantly for their needs and their cultural ways for over 14,000 years. Contact with invading Europeans, however, quickly decimated their numbers through disease and war and resulted in a treaty reserving to the tribes a diminished land base of 2.2 million acres. <clears throat> Once traditional rivals, the three tribes were forced to live in close proximity to one another on these drastically reduced reserved lands. In the 1950s, scalability was a matter for citizenship as well as resource use. America was the melting pot where immigrants could be homogenized to face the future as productive citizens. Homogenization allowed progress. The advance of scalability in business and in civic life. This was the climate in which legislation was passed to unilaterally abrogate US treaty obligations to selected Indian tribes. In the language of the day, members of these tribes were said to be ready to assimilate into American society without special status. Their difference would be erased by law. The rights of the Klamath tribes looked ripe for termination to lawmakers because the tribes were well off. The railroad and the logging of adjacent forests had changed the value of the reservation. By the 1950s, the Klamath Reservation encompassed a large swath of the ponderosa pine that loggers wanted so badly. Klamath Indians were doing well from revenues from timber. They were not a burden on the government, but loggers and officials wanted what they had. The Klamath tribes were by every measure, not only no burden, but a significant contributor to the local economy. Their strength and wealth were, however, no match for determined efforts of the federal government to eradicate their culture and acquire their most valuable natural resources, a million acres of land and ponderosa pine. The stage was set for the dispossession of the Klamaths in the early 1950s when the tribe was subjected to the worst of many disastrous experiments in federal Indian policy termination. As termination proceeded, private companies and public agencies circled. In the end, the federal government took precedence, taking the land as national forest. Uh, Kalmuth tribes Tribe members, uh, tribes members were paid off. Much of the wealth derived from the sale of the Kalmuth, Kalmuth's heritage was lost to sharp dealings by merchants, unscrupulous attorneys that mishandled, embezzled, or engaged in self-defeating or self-dealings or dealing from trust accounts of those determined to be incompetent to poorly considered investments, sometimes by attorneys lending themselves money from the accounts, or to exorbitant fees charged by local attorneys or banks for the handling of the beneficiaries' affairs, which hardly ever got more sophisticated than handing out checks to beneficiaries, a process usually handled in the most paternalistic of ways. The dreams of progress imagined by termination advocates did not make Kalmuth's Cal standard Americans with capital and privilege. Social and personal problems followed. Data compiled for the years from 1966 through 1980 showed the following. 28% died by age 25, 52% died by age 40, 40% 40 of all deaths were alcohol related. Infant mortality was two and a half times the statewide average. 70%, excuse me, 70% of the adults had less than high school education. Poverty levels were three times that of non-Indian Indians in Kalmuth County, the poorest county in Oregon. 
Finally, in 1986, U.S. recognition was restored. Since then, the tribes have pursued water rights and the return of at least some of their reservation land. The tribes have forest management plans for this now overlogged land. The Kalmuths seek return of these lands and, re and resources primarily for the purpose of healing the land and its resources and restoring them to some semblance of the abundance they once reflected. They also seek to restore the spiritual integrity of the land. They want the way of they want their way of life back. For the moment, some are picking matsuki mushrooms. And what of the cutover forest on a landscape once known for its ponderosa, fir, and lodgepole emerged in crowds? Lodgepole has many fine, piney characteristics. And by the 1960s, foresters and loggers did their best to work with it. Mills began processing lodgepole along with ponderosa. In 1970s, replanting schemes, lodgepole rather than ponderosa, was often used owing to its easy establishment on disturbed ground. If you look at the forest from above today on Google Earth, you see mainly swaths of lodgepole growing on old clear cuts. It's not a pretty sight. Turn of the century critics taking foresters by surprise described Eastern Cascade timber areas as festering sores on the back of a mangy old dog and complained that they were visible from outer space. Lodgepole had become noticeable. It is time to make it a protagonist of the story. Lodgepole pinus contorta is an old resident in the Eastern Cascades. It may have been the first tree to arrive after the glaciers melted. After the eruption of Mount Mazama, lodgepole was one of the few trees that could grow on pumice flats. It also flourished in cold pockets on the hillside, which were affected by summer frosts that killed other trees, even ponderosa. In the Western Cascades, it gathers in old mudslides where organic soil was swept away. Working with Matsutake, lodgepole is hardy. Selective logging advantaged lodgepole. In mixed conifer forests, loggers picked the best timber and left the rest. Stumps of sugar pines litter the high mountains, although living sugar pine has become rare. Lodgepole was one of the trees not taken. It didn't mind the disturbance. Abandoned logging roads are thick with young lodgepole. On dry ponderosa slopes, it was the exclusion of fire that most advantaged lodgepole. Lodgepole and ponderosa have opposite piney strategies for dealing with fire. Ponderosa has thick bark and tall crowns. Most ground fires won't touch it. Fire thins ponderosa stands, removing small trees and allowing survivors to dominate hillsides uncrowded by the demands of others. In contrast, lodgepole burns readily. Its thick groves, live and dead trees intermingled, spread fire. But it generates more seeds than most other trees, and it is often the first to reseed burned areas. In the Rocky Mountains, lodgepoles have closed cones, releasing their seeds only in fires. In the Cascades, lodgepoles release seeds every year. There are so many of them that they are quick to colonize new lands. In the open bright clearings that follow clear cutting logging, clear cut logging, Cascades Lodgepole seedlings colonize in thick packs, which sometimes grow into stands so dense that foresters call them dog hair regeneration. One old timer showed me a patch so tightly intertwined that it seemed a welded solid. He joked that we should call it frog hair regeneration. Thick groves are places for diseases and pests. As the 
trees grow up, some start to die. Dead and live wood intermix. Dead trees lean across live ones. Straining under the weight, whole groups blow down. Meanwhile, a single spark can burn the whole grove and with it the rest of the landscape, landscape including private houses, horse camps, timber holdings, and forest service offices. Although a few entertain fantasies of cleaning things up this way, most foresters think this is a bad idea. From Lodgepole's perspective, burning is not so terrible since a new crop of seedlings come up from the fire. Over the long history of the Cascades, fire is one way Lodgepole kept its place on the landscape. But Forest Service fire exclusion has given Lodgepole forests a new experience living into old age. Instead of a rapid cycling of generations, together with fire, lodgepoles in the Eastern Cascades are maturing. And as they mature, they have increasingly met with Matsutake mushrooms. Fungi are choosy about forest succession. Some are quick to establish themselves with new trees, while others let the forest mature before they take hold. Matsutake seems to be a mid-successional fungus. In Japan, research suggests that Matsutake first begin to produce fruiting bodies in pine forests after 40 years. Fruiting continues for more than 40 years thereafter. No one has gathered clear data on this issue in Oregon, but foragers and foresters agree. Matsutake does not fruit with young trees. In the decades of the 21st century, excuse me, in the first decade of the 21st century, pine plantations established in the 1970s and the 1980s did not yet produce Matsutake mushrooms. In naturally regenerating forests, perhaps only 40 to 50 year old trees begins to support Matsutake fruiting. But 40 to 50 year old lodgepole might not even exist except for the Forest Service fire exclusion. The budding presence of Matsutake mushrooms, their mycelia entwined with lodgepole roots is an unintend unintended consequence of the most famous forest service mistake in the interior forests of the American West, the exclusion of fire. Meanwhile, the biggest challenge for foresters today is how to keep densely packed and aging lodgepoles from burning down the forest. This is complicated by changes in the forest service over the past few decades. First, environmental goals had begun to influence the Forest Service by the 1980s. As the Forest Service entered into dialogue with environmentalists, varied new experiments were tried, such as uneven aged management. Second, timber companies moved on and fewer federal funds were made available. It became impossible for foresters to propose any initiative that was not both specifically mandated by law and incredibly cheap. All forest management would have to be subcontracted to loggers in exchange for the best remaining trees. Labor intensive treatments were no longer an option. Without the dominance of big money, of big timber money, foresters have increasingly seen their job as one of balancing various interests among different forest users, for example, wildlife versus loggers, among different forestry approaches, sustainable yields versus sustainable ecosystem services, and among patch ecologies, different patch ecologies, even versus uneven aged management, missing a singular path to progress, they juggle alternatives.
Foresters would like to thin the lodgepoles, but here they run into sensibilities of matus Matsutake pickers who have seen their favorite patches disappear as the result of forest service interference. Foresters appeal to pickers with, with Japanese research, which argues that opening up the forest is a good, that opening up the forests is good for Matsukotake. But forests in Japan are different. Pines suffer from shading by broadleaves. Forest thinning is almost always done by hand. Pines have no broadleaf competition in the Eastern Cascades and foresters there cannot imagine thinning without heavy mechanical equipment. Pickers in the Cascades argue that the equipment breaks and compacts the soil, destroying the fungus. They showed me once productive patches now marked only with the deep and persistent tracks of heavy equipment. Pickers say that fungi or fungi destroyed by soil compaction take many years to reestablish themselves, even when mature tree roots are available. Given that a major government bureaucracy faces off here with rather powerless forest foragers, it is amazing to me that foresters listen to such complaints at all. Perhaps it is a sign of the newly equivocal forest service. In any case, Something extra, extraordinary happened during the Matsutake season of 2008. One forest district decided to officially experiment with lodgepole management for Matsutake. What this meant was not thinning, even where other forest service mandates, such as fire protection, would warrant thinning. At least for a moment, Matsutake had entered the Forest Service imagination and its pact with Lodgepole was noticed. To appreciate how strange this is, consider that no other non-timber forest product has attained the status of management objective, at least in this part of the country. In a bureaucracy that sees only trees, a mushroom companion has made a splash appearance. Mistakes were made and mushrooms popped up. <sighs> Thanks everybody for reading. Um, before we go into uh, discussion groups again, uh, I will just read, reread and repost the question for this week. Um, the title of this chapter is Serendipity. How does the example of lodgepoles and their circumstantial partnering with Matsutake affect your understanding of how ecological relationships form in the forest? This relationship requires years of coordination by humans and non-humans, volcanic eruptions, clear cutting ponderosas, and the exclusion of fire by forest management. Uh, and with that, Jen, do you want to send us into our breakout rooms? Yes, I will send you all there and we'll be there for about eight minutes and then we'll return back to this main room and we'll have a, a larger discussion. So I'll see you all in about eight minutes. Welcome back. Is uh, did all the groups come back? It looks like it. Looks like it. Yep. Awesome. Uh, does anybody want to go first in terms of sharing what was talked in the breakout room? Well, we were doing some very interesting sort of free association in our breakout room, and uh, Susan Clark was just um, kind of walking through both the kind of sadness that, you know, when, when um, how, about how long it takes to regenerate after a fire, um, uh, uh, enough growth in something like a lodgepole pine that you would get a chance to see Matsutake again. 
you know, that certain sense of very visceral um, loss that we as human beings experience when there's the loss of something through a fire versus all of the like the mystery that will re unfold because of the fire and the whole idea that germination takes some um, very long time too. I forgot the number, but I think it was like 48 years. Something um, like that. Um, so, you know, again, it's one of these thinking about these things and kind of wandering through how that all evolves. Uh, really puts the brevity of life in 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 perspective. Yeah, that's definitely something I feel in terms of even thinking about like wanting to. Oh, like you know, oh, it would be so great to work with pine and disturbed landscapes and things like that um, in like an ecological restoration project. But part of you as a mortal has to let go of. Um, seeing the results of that in a way and having to trust in um, the work and the knowledge um, today and, and from many past um, cultures and people and like building trust with the next generation that's going to come up and steward that after you and that's like a that's like not an easy thing to do like your ego kind of screams out and is like you know hey i want to see the the fruits of this of this labor I don't think it's just only uh, building the trust in the next generation, but it's heightening their awareness of what's happening now and educating them to the fact that um, they should still be the caretakers of the land. I think that's really important for the, the next generations, you know, just to take time out from their devices take their head up from the computer and uh, get out and look around. I think that's really important for me, my generation, to pass on to the next generation. So hopefully they'll see the Matsutake in 40 years time, the one that was destroyed by fire, you know. I think that's really important. I'm from, Emily and I are from, sorry, I just have to chime in with a little personal anecdote, but Emily and I are from this region of Southern Oregon. Um, and I grew up in a wilderness area. Um, you know, that's, it's sort of more of like the Western Cascades, but I, I, like some of my earliest memories of landscape was of forests as, you know, she describes in this chapter, um, but then also subsequently, you know, some of my earliest memories are how dramatically that landscape was changed by logging. Um, and so, so it's just interesting to see how, like within my lifetime, returning to the site of, you know, of my origin, I've seen probably like cycles of growth, second, third, you know, fourth forests, grow in the same site within, you know, I'm 38. So that's not that old, you know, getting up there, but um, just, I mean, it puts your own sort of life cycle into a different context when you have, when you see that happening around you. The, um, but I also just wanted to note that um, one thing that came up in our group and sorry, group, I'm repeating myself, but I just wanted to sort of bring up the water um, crisis that's happening in Klamath County at this moment, which is, has to do with a decision that's been made to not irrigate the Klamath River for the first time in 114 years, um, which is the entire history of that irrigation system and the impact it's had on the coho salmon, especially which is an endangered species of salmon, um, you know, native to that area has been devastating. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's happening in real time now, you know, many of the sort of narratives that she touches on in this chapter as well. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's one thing to sort of read about. And then I think part of what I love about this discussion group is like 
and and what's so specific to this chapter is like seeing it with your own eyes experiencing it you know we all sort of have that and whether it's fire or um you know changing landscapes due to all of these different sort of issues but um the matsutakis give it like a silver lining as well i mean that's they're sort of the silver lining to this story if there is one but um yeah thanks for letting me share I think uh, another, um, oh, well, Izzy's back. I was gonna mention your point, Izzy, but I don't wanna steal your fire, but I know you're just sitting down to eat, so, okay. <laughs> and you're really hungry. No, I actually ate the bowl really quickly. Oh. <laughs> like in that whole span of Cascade talking, I ate the bowl, which is probably not good, but. Um, <laughs> so in our group, um, we were talking about pants and how serendipity often implies a sort of chance and uh, how like sometimes, how that idea kind of counters um, an agency of nature or life more so to do what's in its best intention or um, continue for, not, just continue on and, um, but also how serendipity, there's kind of something that undercuts it where it's not quite chance. Like people talk about the serendipity of meeting their soulmate and the way like it's chance, but it's also something that was meant to be. So it wasn't necessarily just chance. It was like, there's an intentionality to it. Um, and yeah, we were just kind of playing with those ideas of like intelligence and fate and the role of that in development of life and um, relations between, say, the Matsutake and Pine. Um, I don't know if I synthesized that well, James, but. Oh, yeah, you did, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll add to it because I definitely was like really inspired by what you said, and particularly that I, th I think serendipity is like a good word even though I, I don't think Singh goes so far to maybe suggest like a intelligence of nature, but I don't think she denies it either. I think she just talks about how we have to open sort of our minds to like new concepts and not close ourselves off because I think part of this book, you can look at things and just sort of be like, wow, like things are so random and spontaneous in nature. Like when you cut down a forest, like like random things happen. And I think those words are like random and spontaneous and chance like can imply a, not an unintelligence, but a lack of intelligence and a lack of, of agency and intuition, or sorry, an intention. Um, and I think Izzy's point really made me think about how um, to open yourself to, at least myself, to the possibility that this reaction Matsutake forming with Lodgepole um, is something deeper to an intelligence or an intention of life and nature. And that just because we don't know that for certain doesn't mean we should close ourselves off to that possibility. Also, I, I have a question for Emily and Cascade, which I'm curious now thinking and reading about lodge poles and fire um, is, do you know if that like has anything to do with the mega fires that Oregon went through in the last few years is these overgrowths of lodge pole and clear cut what weren't once were Ponderosa pine um, land and stuff like that? I think, I mean, as she writes, I think it is a combination of things. It's like the, I mean, she how she describes the forest floor is like cleaned in the ponder, you know, it's, it's so, it's so beautiful when, you know, it's such a gift to be in a forest like that. That's just, 
yeah, that where there's almost like no um, undergrowth. Um, so it's surreal um, and unique, but I am, um, it's, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think it's gotta be a combination of all of many, many elements. Um, you know, our aquifers are running dry and drought has become much more common there. Um, um, yeah, I mean, similar to Northern California, it's, is, you know, it's kind of the most affected, one of the areas most affected by drought. Um, so, but I, I mean, but, but I could imagine that the logging and just like the general sort of decimation of that landscape is, I mean, there really has been no, as she says, no forest management that is, that considers fire except to suppress it. So until now, maybe. Um, and now we have no water, so <laughs> it's, it's our lives. I don't know a lot about the specific question relating to the species, James. Um, and thank you, Cascade, so much for sharing uh, from your heart and from your mind about where we come from. Um, so I don't know how to specifically answer, but I do have a very strong uh, sensory kind of feeling that I can share, which is that like Cascade, I grew up in the wilderness and there was a creek that ran through our land, our property, and it's called Wagner Creek. And I can just tell you that in my lifetime, I'm 41 now, the flow of that waterway has changed significantly. It used to uh, flow with like um, a lot of power and a lot of speed and a lot of volume. And when I visit that same creek now further up the mountain, because my family no longer owns the property, um, further higher up an elevation where it should be even stronger than it, than it you know, than down where I grew up. I can tell you that it's greatly reduced. And luckily the water is still flowing, you know, um, but it's definitely not what it used to be. And I know that's part of the same uh, big story that we're all kind of talking about in this chapter too, is, is how these landscapes have evolved and shifted. Thank you both for sharing your memories, feelings, and thoughts. Really appreciate it. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I just, I, I also just want to say, I, I back to sort of the silver lining of the Matsutake. I just really appreciated her description of, you know, the, the compacting of the soil, everything that, I mean, to, and to sort of touch on Izzy and James, your point about sort of the serendipity of that, like all of the things that coalesce to create something, even if it is just destruction from all sides, it's, there's just a real beauty in that. I really loved that part. All right, well, how would people feel about uh, watching a mushroom time-lapse video? I don't want to cut anybody off if anybody has anything to say, but I'm in the mood. I just I have one thought to take away. Please. How does a squirrel know to pick and wait for the mushroom to dry before he eats it? Is, is this a joke or is this a question? No, 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 it's true. Oh, no, no, I thought there was going to be a punchline. It sounded like... I didn't. Like no. <laughs> nope. They, they pick them and wait for them to dry. Now, there's a bit of intelligence there. Don't they also hide their stash? I saw a squirrel the other day running around with a nut in its mouth, and then it went in somewhere, and I think it buried it, and it's like keeping a stash for later. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, they take the mushrooms, don't they, and lie them on the tree and wait for them to dry? 
Oh, I really? Mean, maybe they taste better that way. Oh, now I'm beginning to doubt myself, but I think so. Yeah, I think they do that. Lots of talking mushrooms. That's really interesting, especially because there are certain mushrooms that are um, poisonous, albeit probably not deadly when they're freshly picked, but when you dry them, the, there's a chemical change that occurs that makes them, can make some of them edible. So that would be really interesting if the squirrels are tapped into like that relationship as well, which wouldn't be surprising. It seems surprising. You're just like, oh, it's just a squirrel, but of course it knows. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll pull up the film. I have a quick um, mushroom question, if I can ask really quickly. Do it. Yeah. Um, so I when we were hiking the other day um, uh, through the Whitney portal or whatever, I don't really know what you would refer to that specific part of the trail as, <laughs> But we saw this plant that I forget the name of, but it's like a non photosynthetic. The snow uh, plant, the crazy red. The red one, yeah. And yeah. one of the people that we were with was saying that she thinks that that indicates a present, like presence of Matsutake, that the Matsutake support that. I. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's, I mean, it could be, I don't want to like, if somebody has reason to say that, but I don't think I, I know of Matsutake in like central or southern California, but it definitely, I know when they're like non photosynthesizing plants that either symbiose or parasitize fungi mm. and, and either are supported by them or steal nutrients from them. Mm. So it definitely, I would say, indicates that there's an underground relationship going on with the fungus. Okay, but not particularly that it's Matsutake that supports that snow plant. It could just be a different fungus. It could be just mycorrhizal. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not an expert in the, the fungi of the, uh, of Paiagunado or the Owens Valley, so. I just really want to smell one. <laughs> Same. Life goal, smell a matsutake. Can you eat them? Oh yeah, they're considered like incredibly uh, delicious, like a very um, strong okay. cultural delicacy, at least in Japan and definitely in other parts of the world. But nice. that's why it's an extremely expensive mushroom. They're delicious and you can get them in the fall and they're not as tasty in America as they are in Japan they're a lot less expensive and they're actually affordable and you can get them at the Japanese market in Los Angeles. Cool. Hot tip. All right. they're, re they're, they're really good for flavoring rice or you could flavor sake with them. You can just cook them in rice. And the, the, the smell is, is, it's a little bit, it takes time to understand it's it's a little bit um kind of off it smells off it's interesting <laughs> yeah some some people again like associate it with the aroma of fall and that's like a very poetic association and then other people who are not used to the smell will liken it to like rotting flesh or or something oh. like that so it's a very pungent smell but it's not it's it's again it's something to adjust oneself to is it the smell of disturbance i think so <laughs> it's a good song title <laughs> Okay, here's our time lapse film for tonight.
Thanks, Emily. Almanitas are poisonous, right? Uh, yeah, yes and no. That's actually one of the mushrooms that, uh, well, yeah, it's one of the mushrooms that changes when you dry it, like I was saying with the squirrels. Um, and Amanitas have been used historically not as a psychoact or a hallucinogenic mushroom, but um, they've been used as a um, psychoactive kind of medicine, sort of, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. But Maybe. definitely don't eat one. Like, yeah, I would say, like, if you want to eat one, you should really do a lot of research if that's your thing. <laughs> Unless you're a deer. Unless you're a deer or a, or bear. a squirrel. Or, or a squirrel. <laughs> they, they definitely love those. Would anyone like to share um, what they're working on or how far they got? I, I will admit I got a little bit further. I will also admit I am actually working on two at the same time, and I keep jumping back and forth. <laughs> Hold them up again, Jen. I didn't see them both. Those so here's are the, so great. Mm, that's beautiful. I it, love that one. It's so much fun to just completely play around with color. Yeah, free, free form. They're so beautiful and so graphic. Yeah. Yeah, it's really exciting. And then I, I too have a bird um, and I too have started with the leaves because I was intimidated by the bird. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but Olen, your bird inspired me tonight. Um, oh, good. How you started coloring yours in. So I'm- Yeah, I feel, I feel in complete doubt now with my bird, but I, no, I no. started coloring it in. It's yeah. gorgeous. Ooh. Oh, I love I, it. Hold it up. <laughs> oh. oh my God. Hold it, hold it up, Olin, again. A little oh, over. Yeah. Hold oh. it up. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bird too, and I'm only going to work on the leaves because oh I can't God. compare. I love yours, Cindy. So Beautiful. Yeah, the leaves. It, it, that's sort of like the entry. It point. is. If you, you do the leaves and you feel like <laughs> I, I know the leaves. I know the leaves. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> wow, that's spectacular. Okay, here's this one. Looks like you know the leaves too. I know the leaves very well as well. <laughs> oh, I like that palette. Hold it up. A, hold it up a little, Cindy. Oh. I like the color oh. palette. It's beautiful. It's That's beautiful. gorgeous. Ah, oh, those burgundies. Yeah. Oh, like amaranth. One more time. I just I just got you pinned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was deep. Wow. Hold beautiful. it up a little. There you go. You're gorgeous. like ready for the birds, Cindy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I might stop at the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pass this on to Olan so she can fill in the, the bird. There you go. There no, you go. I'm full of doubt with every stitch on the no, no. bird. <laughs> Your bird is beautiful. <laughs> Lauren, were you going to show us one? No way. What? <laughs> oh, come on. Right. Well, I'm um. working on the mycelium. Whoa. Whoa. That's nice. I love that. I like it. I love the color. Yeah. That's cool. That's a hard one too. Yeah. I know. Like mystery map. <laughs> yeah. Build your own adventure. I like it. And my my back is equally impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's more on the back than on the front. <laughs> That's actually what mine looks like. That's what mine looks like too. Mine is reversible. Yeah. <laughs> Mine looks like a party in the back. I mean, it's Whoa. out there. Well, I like the back. The important thing is to have fun. 
Thanks, That's Kim. true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> teacher said at midnight yesterday. What? <laughs> Sounds like our Spanish teacher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can show my pasta. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> show us. I might be over there very quickly. <laughs> Wait, I have to stir it so it looks better. <laughs> okay. Here's the juicy pasta. Ooh. Oh, that looks good. Yeah. It doesn't look that good, but it tastes good. <laughs> that's oh, that. I was going to say that's I not true. That, that looks good. It looks good to me. I would eat it if it was if it was here. I would like to eat it. Bye, 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 everybody. <laughs> now Lauren's going to go see ya. <laughs> Dinner bell. It has tuna and anchovies and... Uh, Capers and all wow. of Capers. Garden. And wow. It's pretty good. Garlic. Oh, Lauren did. Lauren just, really yeah. wow. <laughs> she did. <laughs> She's going to pop in You're going to hear a knock on your door <laughs> at any point. Lauren's running. Right knock, now. knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great, Izzy. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I could uh, meet you all soon. Maybe in the next year or two, I'll be able yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> Olam, where are you going? I'm going to uh, near Healdsburg. My son lives there and it's birthday season. Mine's on the 23rd and his is on the 25th. So I'm That's coming back day. here on the 25th, but I'll be up there for the weekend. Nice. nice. Yeah. Birthday parties. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy. I haven't seen him for a year, you know. Oh wow. my gosh. I hate Zoom. I he, he was coerced into a Zoom thing once and he just cannot stand it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get him in person. Yeah. <laughs> Happy yeah. birthday. Thank you. You're yeah, the third I'm person that I know that's born on the 23rd. It must be a really? special day. Yes. Wow. Yeah. My mom, wow. a very good friend. The huh. month of, the month of May is like Christmas. Right. I have, <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have two sons born in May. I have a, a close friend. I mean, there's wow. a lot of folks. But have enjoy your birthday. I you know, I love my birthday. There's something that happens on my birthday that is it's like a gift from the gods. I remember I'm here on purpose and I'm loving it. Okay. <laughs> right on. That's the whole great. day has a kind of sparkle in it. Okay. <laughs> You're a sparkle. <laughs> Thanks for the space, everyone. Yeah. Great to see you. I think I'm going to go hunt some food too. Yeah. It sounds good. I'm going to read a, uh, an ending uh, question of the week. Uh, I think it's a good time, if that's okay. Anybody who's got to run, you can run. But it's just a simple one, no homework, but just to keep a thought with you or question. What examples of coordinated serendipity in places you, have li you live or have lived that depend on historical moments, human disturbance, and geological events? Hmm. Just thinking about serendipity and where you see it. And everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. That's my question. That's my homework. <laughs> or Done. I, I turned it in early. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, have a nice Thanks, weekend, Jane. everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Stay well. Great Great to see be. You too, everyone. See you all next week. Bye. Okay. Bye. Or sooner. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.